Good morning and welcome to the First Baptist Church of Winsboro, South Carolina for Sunday, September the 19th, 2021. Thanks for joining us. We're down to our last two messages in the book of Acts. It's been a wonderful ride and I hope you'll join me today as we go through the missionary in Rome, our next to last message taken from Acts chapter 28, all about what happens when the Apostle Paul finally arrives there. Now, in light of this idea of missionary work, we're actually celebrating something this week, an emphasis we do every September at South Carolina Baptist Churches about our mission work locally in our state through our South Carolina Baptist Convention. We take up something called the Janie Chapman Missions Offering, and those monies are used to help subsidize extra mission work on top of what we already do through the cooperative program and other mission efforts. The theme this year is transforming lives together. Interesting that it's something we've been doing since the very first century of the church when we learned these principles from the early missionaries like the Apostle Paul. There's some great uh, videos online if you want to check out some of this stuff yourself or even if you're in South Carolina, let us know if you need one of the prayer guides and you can pray for some of our missionaries during this emphasis, which we're doing all the way to the end of September. Well, as we get to this particular passage, though, looking at the life of the Apostle Paul, he's an interesting missionary character right now because he's under arrest. He's in chains, and yet it's not stopping him from sharing the good news of the gospel everywhere that he goes. Right now, we're in chapter 28, and as we look at verse 11, we see where Uh, Again, the travel is going to be taking Paul in this day, written by, remember, Luke, Luke the physician, who's the author of the book of Acts. And he says, after three months, we set sail in an Alexandrian ship that had wintered at the island. So they've been stranded there at Malta, but guess what? God's been using Paul in a great and mighty way, which echoes down to the Christian nature of Malta even today. Goes on to say that after they spent this time there. They finally get on this Alexandrian ship, and this is a ship that says it has the twin gods as its figurehead. (laughs) Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there three days. From there, after making a circuit along the coast, we reached Regium, and after one day, a south wind sprang up. The second day, we came to Puteole, and there we found brothers and sisters and were invited to stay a week with them. So we finally came to Rome. Did you notice the months, the days, a week, here and there? You know, in this day and age, we take for granted the fact that we can just jump on a plane and internationally travel thousands of miles and arrive somewhere before you can blink an eye. I think most of us could get to Rome, the capital of the old Roman Empire, faster today from America than Paul could get there in his day from Malta. Isn't that amazing? So with all that in mind, just remember, all along the journey, the Apostle Paul has been making an impact. He and his fellow missionaries are sharing the good news of the gospel. Everywhere they go, they're leaving little breadcrumbs, pointing people to Christ. It's, It's not in vain. Every place they stop, they're not frustrated. They're not upset. They're just letting God put them where he wants them for such a time as this so that they can share. Now, keep that thought in mind as we get to the end of the message, of course. Now, as they came to Rome, it says in verse 15, now the brothers and sisters from there had heard the news about us and had come to meet us as far as the forum of Appius and the three taverns. So when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. When we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Now, what did he see there? Well, Paul is the metropolis of the ancient world. It's the capital of the greatest empire the world has ever seen. It's busy, it's boisterous, it's business-like. In the middle of all the, the scenes he would have seen, all the things that are around in Rome at that time, including even the, the, the magnificent Colosseum and the other sites, you've got to be thinking, what does Paul want to do first? Who's he going to call upon first? You know, Paul's got a heart for his own people, for the Jews. And as has been his pattern throughout the book of Acts, when he goes into a town, he looks for them to share the gospel first. Remember, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. 
So what does he do? He calls for some folks that are Jewish. And it may be striking to you to think that there are Jews all the way over in Rome. But the Jews, remember, have been scattered. They are all over the Roman Empire, literally all over the world, even by now. So what does Paul do? He allows himself to be used first and foremost to reveal Messiah to his own people. It says after three days, he called together the leaders of the Jews. When they had gathered, he said to them, Brothers, although I've done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors, I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. After they examined me, they wanted to release me, since there was no reason for the death penalty in my case. But because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar even though I had no charge to bring against my people. For this reason, I've asked to see you and to speak to you. In fact, it is for the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. You see, Paul still puts things in perspective. He recognizes that Jesus is first and foremost the Messiah of the Jews, and he does not want to shortchange them when it comes to delivering the message. So what? happens? Well, first of all, as Paul begins to reveal this, there seems to be some great curiosity. Look at the curiosity of the folks he'll be talking to. These are the Jews of Rome now. Notice they said to him, we haven't received any letters about you from Judea. None of the brothers has come and reported or spoken anything evil about you, but we want to hear we want to hear what your views are, since we know that people everywhere are speaking against this sect. So how do they look at the way these followers of Jesus is just another sect of Judaism that perhaps is a little weird, maybe a little wacko. Let's hear what you've got to say. Their curiosity definitely has the better of them. They want to, at least from an intellectual standpoint, understand Paul's message. So after arranging a day with him, many came to him at his lodging. Well, how often did Paul preach and teach? Look at this. From dawn to dusk, he expounded and testified about the kingdom of God. He tried to persuade them about Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets. Some were persuaded by what he said, but others did not believe. And you know, that one last sentence could be one that describes the book of Acts almost in its entirety. The message has been shared and shared in power very persuasively, but there are those who are persuaded and they're now new Christians. They're following Jesus. They have been swept into the kingdom. They're now a part of his church, but there are others who did not believe. This is the way all of history has played itself out. Those who receive and those who discover the joy of forgiveness and the blessings of Christ and those who reject him and walk away. Friends, don't be surprised if even though you're able to put together a persuasive argument and build a great case for Jesus, don't be surprised if some of your friends, even though they might love you, will reject Jesus. Well, as we get on to this passage even further, Paul in the midst of the rejection of some, decides to share a little tough love. Tough words from the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. Disagreeing among themselves, we hear, they began to leave after Paul made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in saying to your ancestors through the prophet Isaiah, when he said, and again, quoting from Isaiah, go to these people and say, you will always be listening, but never understanding. You will always be looking but never perceiving. For the hearts of these people have grown callous. Their ears are hard of hearing and they have shut their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Well, I'm sure that a lot of those folks at that point just shook the dust off their clothes and said, I've had enough of this crazy preacher. I'm getting out of here. I don't believe a thing he's got to say. Now, friends, don't be disturbed if people treat you the same way. Remember, Jesus predicted it would happen. Jesus said, they'll hate you, but not because of you. They'll hate you because of me. If they hate me, then they'll hate you if you follow me. I mean, that's kind of what he's saying there in, in John's gospel in the upper room, warning his disciples, warning us. 
There will be people that will reject the message, even if it's the greatest news ever. So what does Paul say? Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. He knew they would listen because they've listened in the past, haven't they? You go all the way back to the house of Cornelius when Peter, not Paul, was preaching. And yes, they heard the message of forgiveness. The Jews have been sent a Messiah, but that Messiah is for everyone. God so loved the world that you can receive forgiveness through his name and the power of his resurrection. And immediately, Peter, who would have probably preached a lot longer, he was no short-winded preacher, my friends, had his message interrupted by the people rushing down the aisle wanting to come to Christ. The Holy Spirit fell on that place as they were then immediately ready to follow Jesus. Paul already knew the Gentiles were ready to be a part of this brand new kingdom. And not all of them, obviously, but enough of them to begin to build the mighty church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what do we hear about Paul and his excursion here in Rome and what's taking place? Luke doesn't give us many more details. The book's almost over. But Paul himself, in his prison epistles, does, does that for us. Now, there are four of his letters that are called prison epistles in the New Testament, but yet there are others of the pastoral epistles we know were written from jail. And because there's another time in which Paul was imprisoned later, a much rougher situation than he's in right now. But either way, how does he put this idea of being incarcerated in perspective? The book of Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, we get a little glimpse into it. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial God, guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. Here's Paul saying, folks, don't feel sorry for me. I'm here on a gospel mission. And because of that, we're watching God turn Rome upside down from the capital. I remember the late Bailey Smith as he was imagining the story of a Roman soldier who might come home after having the audacious duty of guarding the Apostle Paul during this time. Perhaps saying to his wife as he pulled his helmet off of his head, Honey, get me an Excedrin. I got a strange, screaming headache. I'd rather be out on the field fighting somewhere than guarding this crazy preacher. This guy, all he can talk about is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus all the time. It's just driving me nuts. I just wish they'd give me duty somewhere else. Oh, my goodness. And perhaps for days, maybe even weeks, he would talk like that until one day. One day something changed when he would come in, set his sword and his helmet aside. He'd say, honey, come here, gather the children. I need to tell you what happened to me today. I now have discovered and know personally this Jesus Paul is talking about. Let me tell you about it. This is time for a change. This is a time for a new life. This is a time for a brand new kingdom. We thought we were part of something special with Rome, but my friends, listen, oh, my, my children, my wife, my servants, everybody that might be here, I've got news. There's a brand new kingdom on the horizon. Come here, you got to hear about this. See, that's the way lives were being changed, one person at a time, because someone like the Apostle Paul was not sitting there whining and complaining to God about why am I in jail. Instead, he saw himself as a missionary. Let me ask you a question, my friend. Let's get personal. I know sometimes we will say things like, oh, I am stuck in this dead-end job. I feel like a prisoner in my own home. I am, I am just incarcerated in this classroom. I'm, you know, and we will talk about average, everyday experiences in which we feel trapped and suddenly begin to feel bitter, cheated perhaps about these places where God has put us. 
Perhaps if we saw ourselves the way the Apostle Paul saw himself and we expected him to put us in difficult places so we could be gospel witnesses, it might change not only our attitude, but it might win some people to Jesus. Well, friends, why does God have you where you are? Perhaps if you saw the mission and saw the purpose and fulfilled it, then God would move you on to the next place. Maybe that place you want to be and you're striving for that God seems to be so obstinate against giving you. And you're saying, God's not answering my prayer. He won't get me out of this mess. Maybe it's because he's got you in that mess and for a good reason. Well, friends, listen. We need to be more like the Apostle Paul, recognizing that our job, our duty, is to know him and make him known. And if we take on, that's the very motto of uh, Columbia International University, uh, if we take that on and upon ourselves the way the Apostle Paul did, then we'll find not only a new power to share the gospel and see other lives change, but I believe it'll be the change we need in our own lives. Now, as I closed our devotional time in the Gospel of Matthew, I was quoting, especially during the, the resurrection passages from the great Herbert Lockyer Sr., who passed away in 1984, in his little book, The Week That Changed the World. There's something that he does near the very end of his book as he talks about the book of Acts. Yeah, not talking so much about the Gospels, but suddenly talking about the power of those apostles to share this message. Listen to what he says. The Acts of the Apostles is a perfect commentary on the power of Christ's resurrection. For they went forth to conquer in the power of the risen Lord. If they could turn the world upside down, it was because of the power of the risen one who turned the grave inside out. Now, hang on, did you catch that? If they could turn the world upside down, it was because of the power of the risen one who turned the grave inside out. I love it, don't you? Now, to grasp this, he talks about the two different kinds of power represented by the gospel. Because Paul obviously ministered in power, and because of that, he was not susceptible to apparently some of the grave complaining that we are about our circumstances. Instead, he recognized he was walking with God's direction and God's guidance, even if that led him into those throwing stones, those trying to kill him, and even into prison. Now, these two types of power are very important, and Lockyer jumps on these by quoting Dr. J.H. Jowett, who he says tells us that there are two energetic words to be fitted into the word power from the Greek, namely dynamite and dynamo. The dynamite is a negative word, one that speaks of an explosive. It's actually the same word that Paul uses in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where he says that he's not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. And for it to be that powerful, it has to be able to tear down strongholds. That's the way he put it to the Corinthian church. That's the kind of power the gospel has to tear down arguments and pretensions and myths and mythology so that you can hear the truth of Christ and the fact that he is the way, the truth, and the life. But there's yet another kind of power he's going to talk about. He says dynamite is, of course, a negative word, a destructive word, an explosive, a minister of desolation. But there's another word you need to know about. That's dynamo. It's a positive word one that describes the agent of progress. It imparts power of action, driving force and basal strength, describing the activity of the gospel in the book of Acts. The dynamo, on the other hand, being a very positive word, makes us think very much like the thriving factory where all the machines are whirling and they're turning out something, they're creating that's what the early church was doing. It was creating the very life of the brand new body of Christ, a body that wouldn't just be around Jerusalem or even around Rome, but all around the world. Listen to how he closes. He says, the power of our crucified risen Lord is constructive as well as destructive, a dynamo as well as dynamite. 
The dynamo, the resurrection supplies, is a new heart, not new ideas or new ideals. You may have these and still lack the motivation and the power. The resurrection did not produce a new movement, but it created a new body. It did not create a new organization, but a vital organism. You see, that's what the power of the gospel will do in your heart, my heart, in our community, and in our church. I think if each of us began to look, of our, look at ourselves not as just members of some Christian social club when we join a church, but we look at ourselves as missionaries called and placed into this world at this specific time to make a difference, to bless others, to share the good news, so that this power of the gospel the dynamite and the dynamo might be there to tear down the evil and the wicked and get it out of the way, but also that we might have the power of the resurrected Lord to create in us the clean heart we need and create the dynamic church of the living God against which the gates of hell cannot expect to stand up. Oh, friends, that's what it's all about. Paul's demonstrating it for us after we've gone through this book of Acts and seen it demonstrated in the lives of so many believers, the only question is, will we take on the same mantle? Will we let this power of the risen Christ invest our very beings? Will we let it change us from the inside out? Will we become the missionaries, just like Paul, who were willing to go anywhere and do anything, to change the world for Christ. I hope your answer is yes this morning. And I hope we continue to move forward and expect the great and glorious day when Jesus returns to be one of, con of confirmation about this missionary journey we've all been on. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. Let me pray for you before we close. Father, I pray for everyone listening to my message. They may feel trapped. They may feel caught maybe in a job or in a relationship or in a circumstance that they can't get out of. Lord, would you change their mind this morning? Let them see themselves not as trapped, but privileged to be in the place where you have put them to be a messenger, a missionary, a blessing, a point of light in a dark place. And Father, may you light them on fire for Jesus today. In his name we pray. Thanks. I'll see you right here next week, every day, as we wake up in the Word and next Sunday with the message from First Baptist Church right here in Winsboro, South Carolina.